welcome to Tome of Uselessness. I'm Devin. I'm Dan. And today is going to be a different episode. Dan is going to tell me all about his absolute favorite movie of all time, 1987's Mannequin. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, no, what are, what are we talking about, Dan? Well, initially I had thought about doing a just a solo recording about the Millennium Trilogy, but then I was telling you, slash I was telling Devin about that, and then you were requested that we kind of do a mini episode because you said that you had no major interest in probably reading or consuming this, but you were interested in what the story about it was. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem that I have sometimes. I'm like, I want to know what the thing is. Yeah. But I also, like, I, so I'm sure it's, like, well-written and entertaining and stuff, but um, I've heard that there's some pretty graphic sexual assault scenes, and I just, I, when I'm reading for pleasure or or watching stuff for pleasure, I just don't want to see that. (laughs) That's what it comes down to. Yeah, that's fair. So I have no problem just hearing about what the story is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so we're going to focus on uh, the Millennium Trilogy by Stig Larsson. And so that's just the girl with the dragon tattoo, girl who played with fire, and girl who kicked the hornet's nest. Double check oh. that, that that's not what it's called. They have different titles in Swedish, which I was going to talk about as well, because it's kind of interesting that they were changed. What were they in Swedish? Uh, so these ones in Swedish, so the first one's called uh, Men Who Hate Women, and they changed it because they were like, don't think that's a marketable title. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. The second one is the same, actually, The Girl Who Played With Fire, okay. which will make sense when I tell you the story. And then the third one, though, was called in Swedish, uh, The Air Castle That Was Blown Up. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> it has a nicer sound to it in Swedish. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I could butcher it for you if you really want to hear what it says because i have the swedish words in front of me <laughs> no it just it sounds clunky in english the air castle yes. that was blown up yes yeah <laughs> it also could be like a turn of phrase because uh he was a reporter so maybe that there's some kind of maybe that's like a term for you know like a paper tiger or something you know what i mean like where it's like something that what's was a, what's a paper tiger uh, paper tiger usually refers to something that's like it's you know it seems like it's gonna be super dangerous and etc. But it's like made of paper. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a guess. I'm not 100 percent here. On that. <laughs> How um, <a> moving castle. <laughs> yeah, basically. So, girl with the dragon tattoo, the first one. Uh, men who hate women. <laughs> men who hate women. So in Sweden, it was released in 2005. And came out with a UK edition in January 2008. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get introduced to our main character, uh, Mikhail Blomkist, or Blomquist. And he's basically, he's a reporter. He works for a magazine called Millennium. And he is part owner, part publisher of the magazine with his longtime partner and friend. Her name is Berger. I can't freaking remember where. (laughs) I can't remember what her first name is now. <laughs> Burger. <laughs> yeah. But so she she's married to another man, but they have like an open relationship. Like Mikkel and her um, sleep together on occasion or stay together. And her husband's cool with that. And Mikhail, he has a divorced wife and a daughter. and But she's only in there minorly. It's, she's just kind of mentioned. So it's kind of like, that's just like his background. He, you know, okay. he's a dude. And at the beginning of the the story, he is being... There's like a trial and he's being uh, prosecuted for libel and like slander. And he loses the case. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. So so our hero is like already at a low start point. (laughs) And basically he he's like it it was because of an article he published in the in Millennium about the Wernerstrom group, which is like some kind of business conglomerate, but he believes that the owner leader guy of it is a criminal and supposedly he had evidence and everything, but it was basically a setup. These are his words in the beginning of the book. He's like, I was set up. It was bad. So he's like, I'm just going to quit the magazine for a little bit, step back so you guys can still run the magazine and my like 
reputation won't be part of it for now. Okay. And so he gets contacted by an old man lawyer who he basically represents a rich client. And he's like, hey, this guy just wants to meet you. He'll pay you for your time and et cetera. And so he goes and this guy wants him to investigate the basically proposes. He's like, hey, I will hire you to write my biography and the biography of like my company and stuff like that. But really, he's like, I want you to investigate the disappearance or death of my niece. All right. And yeah, basically, it's like she disappeared back in the 60s. We were at a family gathering. There was an accident and then she disappeared. So he thinks she was murdered because he keeps on getting flowers every year, which was a gift she used to give him when she was a child. Ooh, OK. Yeah. So there's yeah, there's a mystery element there. He's like, I don't, I can't do that. I'm going to go to jail. And, you know, that's just, you know, if there's been cops involved with this, he's like, what am I going to find? And he's like, and the guy's like, I'll pay you. You know, you can do your jail time. That's fine. And et cetera. So he agrees to do the job. Okay. And then we also get introduced to our other main character, Lizbeth Salander, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason she's kind of introduced is that the lawyer for the old man had her hired well had a, a security company hired to do a like a background check on Mikhail. And she was a person who did the research. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it, so it's revealed that she is essentially she's a hacker. And because she like hacks his computers and like, you know, finds his bank accounts and etc. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So she's got hacker skills. And as we learn later in the book as well, she has a photographic memory. Ooh. Yeah, but... Can, it, can I ask a question real quick? Sure. How much does the film differ from the book? Well, obviously, greatly in some areas, but other than that, pretty close in many areas. Okay, so, like, everything that you're telling me happens in both? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, like, uh, there's a... Like, I think in the Fincher version... I don't think they, they don't mention Daniel Craig's daughter or Mikhail's daughter. <laughs> I don't think I don't think she's in the story. I could be blurring that. But in the the Swedish one, they do bring the daughter in for like a one care one scene kind of situation. OK. Oh, you watched both? Yeah, I watched I watched it all. <laughs> oh, nice. Which one was better, English or or Swedish? I actually like them both. I was going to talk about them after I tell you about the books. OK, sorry. Keep going. No, that's OK. So, yeah, we get introduced to Elizabeth. The main kind of thing is, is that she basically she's like small, tiny, pale goth girl with tattoos and piercings and weird hair. She just doesn't look like typical. You know what I mean? Person, as it were. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah. We also find out she has been declared mentally incompetent by the government and has like a. Oh, my gosh. Why can't I think of words right now? <laughs> she has a guardian. Who like supposedly handles her money and you know legal documents and that kind of stuff, right? But she's a hacker. She's a hacker, yes. So basically, because the way it is 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 that she has like zero trust in authority. So anytime someone's like, "Hey," and she just like shuts down and is like, "Nope," doesn't talk to them. So they're like, "Well, this girl is clearly like doesn't know what's going on and etc." Gotcha. Yeah. So her guardian has a heart attack, and so unfortunately. She gets assigned a new guardian. Yeah. And so the new guardian is like looking over her file and is also like, hey, the other guy was too nice to you, et cetera. She's, he's like, I'm going to control your accounts and et cetera. And then, yes, he sexually assaults her. <laughs> oh, it's her guardian? That's fucking gross. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he assaults her so she can get money for like food, essentially. And so she devises a plan where she's like, okay, this is, this can't go on. So she wires up her backpack with like a camera so that she's like, okay, I'll, you know, record him assaulting me so that I can like blackmail him to either stop or whatever her plan is. Right. Mm -hmm. But then the second time he very violently assaults her and ties her down to the bed and like, you know, proceeds to rape her and et cetera. And it goes way beyond. Mm. Yeah. And this was one thing I was really surprised in, like in the book, it's it's sort of described, but not like too vividly. 
And yeah. but I was I was surprised in both versions of the movie they went way further than I thought they were going to. Ugh, that's gross. Yeah, it's gross. I mean, it's and it's meant to be, hence the men who hate women, right? Yeah, I just uh, I don't know. I I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, can't they just imply it? <laughs> well, this was something I was gonna bring up in the Fincher version. I thought they did they were gonna do like a very artful job because she he like handcuffs her and then you hear some screaming and like a door slams in front of like the screen. And I was like, oh, okay, it, you know, that really tells you, but then it like cuts into the room and then starts showing you more. And I was like, Whoa, okay. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, yeah, I was like, it visually told you what was happening without it. And then they just went further with it. But so yes, he assaults her is bad. She, she gets some mad revenge though. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah, it's pretty intense. So what she does is she goes back to his house like later and she tasers him, handcuffs him, ties him up. And basically, when he wakes up from being tased, she shows him the video and is like, I recorded this, you piece of shit. If something happens to me, it's going to go to all the newspapers. It's going to go to the media. It's going to go on the Internet and you're done. So she basically blackmails him. She's like... I'm going to control all my money. You're going to write the report saying I'm good. And then in a year, you're in a year or I can't remember if this was from the books or the movies, all kind of blurs, but she's like, you're going to present to the courts and say, I'm mentally fit and get me out of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And she also, what she does, she does a couple other things. I won't bother describing it, but the main thing she does is she ties him down and then tattoos on him. She's an amateur. She, she doesn't tattoo in, in, in that's not her skills. Okay, okay. And she tattoos, I am a sadistic rapist and pig on his chest. Oh, good. <laughs> As she should. As she should, yes. Basically, yeah, she also, like, hacks his computers and everything kind of thing. So she's just like, I'm I'm watching you. And <laughs> she gets out. So, like, it's, it's satisfying revenge for sure. And you're also like, damn, it is brutal. And it's very, in the book especially, it's described very cold and calculated because she's sort of on that sociopath scale. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it's not untoward, as it were. You're just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Good, do it. Do it yeah. again. <laughs> so, cutting back to Mikhail, he re he's researching the family, and he's researching, like, this disappearance slash murder. And eventually he is like, hey, there's a lot going on. I might need some help. Can I hire somebody as an assistant? And he... He sees the report about him, and then he tracks down Lisbeth because he's like, I want to hire you to mm -hmm. be my assistant. And so that's how our characters kind of meet up and start working together. Cool. Yeah. So they work together on this mystery. Uh, it's it's actually, it's I was surprised. And again, like we joked about, it's there was a reason it's popular. But it, it was good. It was well written. Very, I was intrigued and wondering what was going on. And then it starts expanding and going to different locations. It all takes place in Sweden of course, and at the end, they sort of solve the mystery. Oh, nice. What, what, why did, what, what happened? What okay. <laughs> well, I've been kind of talking generalities here, but I guess, okay, spoilers, <laughs> as I've been saying all this stuff. But Okay. <laughs> so they find out that there's been murders of women done in a ritualistic way following biblical passages. Oh, no. Satanism yes. again. <laughs> no, it's not Satanists. That's the point. <laughs> oh, it's, it's God-fearing folk. Yes. And it's also sort of, there's some white supremacist Nazi stuff going on. <laughs> oh, no, not the Nazis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, as they investigate, they find, figure out that these murders have been occurring and following these Bible passages. And they figure out eventually that it was one of the main, um, the guy who hired him. It's, it was his brother doing that. So his and own we, daughter? No, she, well, <laughs> here's what happens is that eventually the daughter has a brother as well. And then one night uh, when they're like attacking her kind of thing, she mm -hmm. runs outside, conks the dad and drowns him in the, in the, in the, the river or water in the area. Oh. But her brother sees him, her doing this and then kind of uses that as blackmail against her. The brother gets sent away to like boarding school. And when he comes back, she at that dinner, she basically she's like, I'm out. 
if he comes back, he's going to like say stuff or, you know, either attack me again and stuff like that. So then she hid away and then disappeared off the island. But the murders have been continuing and we find out it's the brother been continuing these murders throughout the years. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's pretty good. And it's it's well done in that both uh, Mikhail and Lisbeth kind of figure it out at the same time, but independently. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Yeah. And like I said, it's it's well it's well written in that way. But then he gets caught, Mikhail, sorry, at his house. Martin is his name. He's kind of like trying to play it off that he was like in the area or whatever kind of thing. But he gets basically captured by Martin and then put oh. down in his dungeon of doom. <laughs> oh, no. Does and Elizabeth so, save him? While while Martin is going to work on Michael or Mikhail, sorry, Lisbeth does enter and she does save him. And eventually it leads to... Again, this is all kind of blurring. I was like, I didn't remember in this in the book, but maybe it did happen. But anyway, there's a small chase. He crashes off of a thing because she she messes him up pretty good with a golf club. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Good. And and then uh, he dies basically. Martin, not Mikhail. Yeah. No, she saves. She, uh, Elizabeth saves Mikhail, and then yeah, Martin dies in the ensuing kind of chase and incident. Which is which was satisfying. You're like, yeah, way to go, team. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and then there's kind of a cool capper to the to the story in that Elizabeth, after she delivered her report in the beginning of the book, started investigating Warner's room because she was like, well, what happened with uh, this guy? Supposedly he's like one of the best reporters. Why would he just be making stuff up? So then she tells Mikhail this that she's like, hey, I've been investigating him. Let's check out what I found. And then so together they investigate the company and figure out that, like, yeah, there's been all sorts of shady stuff and et cetera. So then he gets the evidence necessary to then really nail the company. But she, because she's been using her hacker skills, finds all his money and then drains all his accounts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she transfers them all to herself and into other accounts around the world. Right. So nice. So she has a ton of money by the end of the book. And uh, Mikhail gets his revenge. They also, this was not depicted as well, I didn't think, in the movie, the the Fincher movie. But they figure out that the woman that escaped, the niece, they track her down. And oh. they find her in Australia, basically like running a farm kind of a thing. And then, they, you know, Mikhail tells her, he's like, hey, he's been looking for you for years, etc. So they go back and she, because he, at the time when she was younger, thought that she would be a good protege to run the company so mm-hmm. he they basically do that where he's like i'll train you up you run the company now nice yeah so it kind of ends on that note and it's pretty cool semi-happy ending as it were <laughs> for all and the everyone terrible... lived happily ever after <laughs> sure uh <laughs> until the next book <laughs> really uh-oh so yeah it was interesting though in this one that there was a time gap so there's a year gap between uh, Dragon Tattoo and Girl Who Played With Fire. Okay. Which I wasn't expecting right away. Uh, but this one sort of starts... I guess maybe before I get going, did you have any other tr- questions maybe about Girl With Dragon Tattoo? Did it no, make sense? it makes sense to me. Everything <laughs> checks out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, it's it's well written, all the, like, the research that they do and how they find the evidence and everything like that. It's pretty good. But how playing with fire starts is it really shifts in that we start get to get uh, like bad guy POVs, whereas we didn't in the first book. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah the first book's ma- mainly through, of course, just like Mikhail and Lisbeth. This one we start yeah. getting, uh, we get some bad guys going, doing some stuff, and we get uh, Brunman, who was her guardian that she tattooed. Mm-hmm. He wants revenge of some insult <laughs> of some kind, right? <laughs> Oh, no, but he's a dick. He is. And he, so he starts doing some more dickish things where he starts making contact with some criminal groups. And he basically tries to either want Lisbeth like killed or kidnapped or disappeared in some way. Because, of course, he blames her and he's, she's all like, she's messing up my life. And it's like, eh, yeah, guy, this was, this was all your fault, really. <laughs> yeah. How's she messing up your life? Did she make you rape her? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Although I'm sure he thinks that, because that's always what those fucking assholes think. (laughs) 
Yeah, and that's what's depicted in the book, of course. Is like yeah. like I said, is he's, he's he's twisted all around. So he he's investigating Lisbeth's background, going back to the like she's doing pretty well. She went off and traveled and has been out of Sweden the whole time, just going around the world. Good and her. yeah, and Mikhail and then the ma- magazine's doing well after his big bombshell kind of you know revenge and everything's kind of sailing along. And they get approached at the magazine by a reporter, or he's like, wants to be a reporter, but basically his girlfriend is working on a thesis or a PhD doctorate, sorry, involving trafficking of women from Eastern Mm -hmm. Europe into, or Eastern uh, bloc, like Soviet type countries into Sweden. And he is writing, he's, he's, she's focusing more on like, uh, the women and stuff like that. And so he's focusing more on like the crime stats. He's writing a story about it and he approaches the magazine being like, hey, would you guys publish this story, publish this book about it? And then they're like, yeah, let's do this. Okay. So yeah, so they devise plans and they're like, okay, we're going to do this story. It's pretty intense stuff, of course. And he, the, his name is Dag. He's like, I have evidence against all these people and you know, some of them are my judges or cops or whatever. At the same time, it kind of sets up that some of the people that are involved in that story, you know, they're doing other criminal drug dealing and this and that kind of stuff, enterprises. They blackmail, they basically blackmail one of the Johns into like being his stoolie and so- involved with something involved with the Lisbeth stuff. It, 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 it's kind of weird and too coincidental in my mind, but then the story kind of really takes off in that. Basically, Dag and his girlfriend get murdered. No. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because their involvement in their research, right? Can I, Sorry, I'm just going to, on an off note, like on yeah. a side note, mm-hmm. whatever somebody says, blah, 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 gets murdered, my immediate brain thought goes to that quote in The Princess Bride when uh, Grandpa's reading to Fred Savage and he's like, murdered by pirates is good. <laughs> <laughs> I always want to respond with that, but I, I hold back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, no pirates involved in this one. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Keep That's going, okay. I'm ready. I'm on the train. I want to know what happens. Well, so what happens is, is yeah, they get murdered. And at the time, Mikhail was actually going to visit them. And as he gets there, he's there like less than a minute after their death. Oh, shit. And it's just, yeah, he's like, oh, no, what has happened, blah, blah. And then he finds a gun in their apartment complex. The cops show up and he tells them the story. Uh, they were both unfortunately dead. And he gets arrested. Well, he doesn't get arrested, but he has to give statements and blah, blah, blah. But then it's like he basically figures he's like, well, it's got to be connected to their research. So he convinces the magazine and his partners to, to go along with it, that he's like, we're going to you know, continue to research this. But then what happens is coincidentally, Lisbeth's prints are on the gun. Uh oh. But she's the good guy. Well, we know it. But <laughs> so basically, what happens is she has to go into hiding because she's like, what the heck? I didn't murder these people. So it's kind of different in this story where both Mikhail is doing his research and Lisbeth is doing research, but they're not working together really on this. Okay. Yeah, which is kind of too bad. But then they, at, at some point in the book, which is he remembers that she was a hacker and that he hacked, she hacked his stuff. So he starts writing like messages on his computer, figuring that she would eventually find it, which oh. she does. <laughs> she does. Yeah. yeah, which she does. So then they start to kind of work together a little bit. But like, like I said, yeah, so we get some bad guy POV. And this one really shows how public opinion is worked in like the media frenzy because basically they they're like Elizabeth Salander is our primary suspect for these murders and then then her whole record gets kind of dragged up into the public and it's like look she's like a weird goth girl she's been arrested for assault and like you know she's been under guardianship and all this stuff she's a weird goth girl (laughs) yeah that's basically what the book says (laughs) I love it so much (laughs) Well, because at one point, um, like, the cops are investigating her, and she was hung out with, like, this band called, uh, I think it was called, like, the Five Evil Fingers, and it was a group of, like, women, and they were, like, a punk band or whatever, right? And, and then, of course, they right. all look 
punked out and they're like, well, clearly there's some sort of Satanist lesbian ring. <laughs> yes, that's the book <laughs> I want to read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, at the same time, we get cops investigating the murders. We get Mikhail investigating the murders. And we also have Lisbeth doing some investigating as well. Basically, like, opinion is split in the cops, like the the DA type guy, like the prosecutor is like, well, we got to capture her. She's like the main suspect. And so does the main guy. But then he's also working sort of with Mikhail. And he's like, she didn't do this. Like, I'm pretty sure. Like, it doesn't make sense. It's like not her MO, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, not saying she doesn't do crimes, but <laughs> she doesn't do this. <laughs> right? She doesn't do this kind of crime. <laughs> yeah. So and anyway, he starts to kind of maybe believe her or believe Mikhail about that as well as uh, one of the other cops. But then there's like, you know, misogyny cop number one. And he's, mm. you know, she's clearly a lesbian Satanist and she must be arrested. Right. The whole book. And you're like, this guy is such an ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's correct, though. She's a lesbian Satanist. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> But here's how it all kind of culminates. So it turns out that what happened was, is one of the names in the list or that was being kind of potentially investigated is a person named Zala or Sala, I guess. And then it turns out that stands for Salachenko, who was a Russian K, uh, he wasn't KGB, sorry, he was GRU. He was a Russian crew agent in the Cold War who defected to Sweden. Oh, okay. So the Swedish police, secret police anyway, uh, Sapo, they set up to protect him because they're like, he's an informant and it's, you know, good on us, right? He had two daughters and one is Lisbeth Salander. Oh. He was also very abusive to their mother. Okay. And one day after he abused their mother, Lisbeth tossed gasoline all over him in his car and lit a match. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's like her. <laughs> yeah, this this is our girl playing with fire here moment. And yeah, yeah. he didn't die. Oh. Yeah, he was horribly burned, 80% of his body and you know years of recovery, but he didn't die from the incident. But the I'm police not dead, I'm very badly burned. <laughs> yes. But the police <laughs> covered it up because they were like, we still are protecting this guy. And then they had Lisbeth committed, saying she was a violent psycho. Oh, okay. Which when she was, be, yeah, they had good reason to, I guess. But she was only twelve years old at the time. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> that's not. That's not as good. <laughs> no, it's it, it, it's all pretty terrible. And so they like basically conspired with like lawyers and a child psychologist and the police to lock her up, and because they were like, this girl is going to cause trouble. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she is basically, she's out for revenge. She's like, I'm going to have to track down my dad and kill him because it's, this is the only way it's going to end here. Because he killed, you know, these other people. And it's just like a way for her to clear her name because she's like, I didn't do these murders. Also, he, her dad just generally sucks. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, through, they explain through the book how he's basically, after his information, he, he's basically turned back to crime and like, you know, drugs and weapons and et cetera and prostitution. And mm -hmm. so she, yeah, she's like, time to take him down. Okay. Yeah. There's some other stuff that happens. Like her friend ex, uh, gets accidentally kidnapped because they think that's it. It's Lisbeth because she's in the apartment that where Elizabeth used to live. There's some stuff like that that kind of happens. But what happens at the end is she does manage to track down where her dad lives now. And, uh, and similar to the other book, Mikhail also tracks down where, her dad lives now. Ooh. She's going to confront him. He's going to, to, to try to either help her or stop her or do something. And so she goes that she gets there and she screws it up. She gets captured. <laughs> oh no. So it's her dad, her, and then this guy called uh, Niedermeyer, who is like this German. And it turns out it's her half brother. And he has a genetic defect where he can't feel pain. Oh, okay. Yeah, but he's like this big, like, bruiser type guy, right? Niedermeyer goes out and digs a grave. They drag her out there, and they're like, all right, you're going down. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. But she, she tries some trickery. They shoot at her a little bit. They clip her in the shoulder as well as the hip. But then they also shoot her in the head. 
and she goes down. Yeah, that would do it. And then they bury her. Oh, that's okay. So she's just dead. <laughs> she's just dead. Or so you think. Because it turns out the bullet didn't kill her, and it was from a twenty two. This was this was something I didn't like even reading it. I was like, you could have just made it so it like grazed her head or like really hurt her, but not like shot her in the head. <laughs> yeah. But she manages to she's messed up. She manages to unbury herself from the soil and then like drag herself back to the house. It's like a farmhouse. Like in Kill Bill 2? Basically, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I like it. <laughs> yeah, so she's like covered in dirt and blood, all messed up. And manages to, like, get an axe. And when her dad comes to investigate, she axes him in the leg and in the face. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then when Niedermeyer shows up, he sees her, you know, with the axe and everything. And he just kind of has, like, a psychological break moment and, like, runs away. <laughs> Good. Uh, she goes in the house, lies down. Mikhail finds her all messed up and calls the police. And then that's the end of the book. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was pretty sudden because it was just like, he, Mikhail actually also runs into Niedermeyer and manages to like subdue him with like a gun and, and like handcuff him to a, to a post kind of thing. But it's like, cool, well done. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so he finds her all messed up, calls, the, calls for help. And then, yeah, like literally the book just ends. And I was like, whoa, that's, that was kind of weird. All right. So yeah, sorry. So it turns out, the mystery was Niedermeyer killed Bruman because Bruman was getting um, all insistent about Lisbeth. And he's all like, you're not doing anything. You're not helping me, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, this guy's just more trouble than he's worth. Shoots him with his own gun who Lisbeth had found in his house when she was rummaging through her house. Or through oh, his house, sorry. That's why her fingerprints were on it. Correct. Because Niedermeyer went and then shot Dag and his girlfriend because they were, like, investigating Zala. Okay. So, yeah, that's why her prints were on the gun, and that's why she became the number one suspect. It was just, like, coincident <laughs> that that happened. Yeah, that's a bit shaky, but that's okay. Yeah, even I myself, I was kind of like, that's a little too convenient, but I was like, okay, you know, it's just, it's in service of the story. Sure, yeah, yeah. I'll allow it. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, then the next book, Girl, what was it called? Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Mm -hmm. It starts... Literally the same night. It just continues straight on. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, which I was not expecting, but I was also like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, basically cops show up to try to figure out what's going on. Mikhail gets handcuffed to a chair and is explaining to the cop what's going on. They bring in, you know, ambulance and et cetera to chop her Elizabeth to a hospital because she's been shot in the head. Mikhail tells the guy, he's like, hey, Niedermeyer, who did it? He's handcuffed to this street post, blah, blah, blah. He send, the, the cop sends a couple of uniformed guys to go get him. Niedermeyer kills them and escapes. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some stuff about uh, Elizabeth getting surgery, of course, and she, she comes through okay. Yay. Yeah. So, again, it, it was kind of interesting because, again, our two main characters are split up. And Lisbeth is in the hospital for 90% of the book. Oh, weird. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was weird, but it was still, it was still, you know, interesting. And cause you're always like, you're like, you want to know what's happening with her because her dad also survived. Who oh, she shit. asked in the face and is in the hospital, like three doors down from her. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very tense. Does she just not sleep for the entire time? <laughs> Well, of course, she's in and out because she's on heavy meds because she got shot in the head. Um, but when she eventually realizes, yeah, that he's down there, every time she, like, he he starts to kind of move around and stuff like that, she, like, reaches for, like, a pencil or anything that she's like, maybe I can stab him if he comes near me. <laughs> maybe I can stab him with this. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> okay, okay. And so... You know, Mikhail, again, he's like, I got more evidence that she didn't do it and blah, blah, blah. But they're like, OK, what happens is, is this is where the conspiracy all kind of starts getting more revealed with the the secret police or the sapo, mm -hmm. where they are like, we're going to cover this. Not, not that we have to cover this up, but let's, OK, get Lisbeth recommitted again. And everything we did, you know, was Sala. His old like handler basically comes back and he's like, I'll deal with this. 
you know, and we'll, we'll figure this all out. So this book is really focused on like espionage and counter espionage. And okay. so what, what the old guy does, he goes to Salah and he's like, Hey, what do you, what, what's, what's your deal here? And Salah's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell and spill the beans and stuff unless I, you know, I get better protection and I don't get arrested for uh, shooting my daughter. Cause he's basically telling the cops that he's like, I was just doing it in self-defense and Niedermeyer, like I was afraid of him. He, I hired him to help me around the house cause I'm an invalid. Uh, but it, he started turning weird. He's just trying to sell this story and even the cops don't really believe him. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, okay, guy. But so this old spook is there talking with him. And then the old spook, which I really like this because I was like, well, this is pretty extreme. He shoots Salah <laughs> three times. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. At, at the same time, uh, Elizabeth, Mikhail's sister, is a lawyer, and she mostly deals with like um, uh, women abuse cases and stuff like that. And Mikhail convinces her to take on Elizabeth as a client because he's like, this is what's going on with her. He doesn't tell her everything, but he tells her a little bit. She's at the hospital at the same time as the shooting. And then Buddy, after she shoots Salah, tries to enter her room, but the sister is there and blocks the door. Ooh. Yeah, so he was basically going to kill both of them and just be like, the problem is solved. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but so she doesn't get in, or he doesn't get in, can't shoot Lisbeth. Uh, so he goes back into Sal's room, shoots himself, and we learn that he also has like a very advanced cancer and that he was probably going to die within six months anyway. So he was just like, eh, this can help the country. I'm out. <laughs> okay. So basically, it mostly focuses a lot on Blomquist because he's he's the one out 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 there, as well as a character I haven't really talked about, uh, Aramansky, which is Lisbeth's boss, who works uh, when she does work at the um, security agency. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they basically they both like they're like Lisbeth didn't do it. She's gonna need some help through this because everyone believes she's a weird Satanist killer. Uh, so <laughs> you know, so they're like working on the case essentially, right? Blancas is investigating. He gets access to like the old files showing how Elizabeth was imprisoned and like et cetera. And then he also eventually finds her apartment um, because she bought it. Like she had like a company basically buy it. Right. So it was like her name wasn't on any of the property anymore. Oh, OK. That's smart yeah. of her. Yeah. With her, her. So she bought like this baller apartment, you know, with like a view and et cetera. It's like a mansion apartment uh, like it's like a like a floor of an apartment building because she had all that money, right? So yeah, the um, he finds her apartment because basically uh, his copy of that report gets stolen, his sister's copy of that report gets stolen, and so there's like they know they have a version at their offices, the Millennium offices, and so he's like someone's got to stay at the office like always, so people sleep there and stuff like that. So he basically figures out how. The Sapo is probably like tapping his phones, tapping his apartment, tapping like everything they can. And so it becomes, like I said, very much about counter espionage where he gets this uh, Aramansky involved who, like I said, they do private security. Right. So they like they put cameras in his apartment and then they catch people like going into his apartment. And it's like, OK, so then they start investigating these people who are going into his apartment. Right. So there's like a real back and forth. Oh, and eventually through Aramansky's contact. He, they get an, they get a hold of like again I'm not sure the equivalent but like like a minister of justice type guy who's okay. like not a prosecutor but he's like above that kind of level and they basically lay it out where they're like hey there's this conspiracy going on these people are breaking into my house and there's you know planting drugs and like do all sorts of stuff like that right <laughs> and, and so uh, basically yeah like they start investigating as well and so like I said very much. It's pretty cool. Well, well, well depicted, well written of like, yeah, back and forth espionage stuff. And just unfortunately, the whole time Elizabeth is sidelined. Mikhail manages to smuggle her like a like a Palm Pilot type device. So she's able to access the Internet and then so they can talk and then she can basically write her version of the story because, again, she can hack the planet. But yeah, like the prosecutors are still going to um, charge her with like the assault of uh, Zalachenko. Oh, OK. And like I said, they like, they want to try to get her committed again because they're like, hey, she's got a history of violence and she's crazy. Right. Mikhail and the sister are like, write your version. And we have all this documentation that you know about. And and she, Mikhail also finds the disc that Lisbeth has of when Bruman attacked her. 
So she's like, we can bring that up, of course, as well. Have uh, to because basically it's like the cops are saying, like, when she finally writes that ver her version of the events, they're all like, this is crazy. None of this ever happened, blah, blah, blah. And then we know as well as uh, they know but the characters, they, they have the evidence because they're like, yeah, we have this DVD of it. It's bad, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's real bad, guys. It's real bad. Yeah, so the the sapo tries some stuff, but it doesn't all work out to, you know, either discredit Mikhail or have him arrested for stuff, and et cetera, right? And so the book is really focused on the trial of Lisbeth Salander. It's going to be like a three-day trial. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, 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 I, I enjoyed the depiction of it because the... The prosecution, he like, he's like, so you went to the house, blah, 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 to like do this. And she's just kind of like staring at him. And he's like, well, I asked you a question. She's like, no, you didn't. That was a statement. <laughs> 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 and the judges are like, yeah, you have, you didn't ask her a question. <laughs> 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 nice. Yeah. So there's some cool back and forth in there. And basically like the prosecutor lays out this like stuff. And then they have that child psychologist guy that Telebrorn, I think his name is probably butchered that he's all like testifying about how her mental capacity isn't good and like he did a uh, a mental evaluation of her and you know she's psycho but basically again and as the readers we know this is all false mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of like two different sides of it because i'll talk a bit about it in a second uh, but the movie did it like sort of backwards where it hid this information from us whereas in the book we we know like we're ahead of all these people in the story so it's like i can see oh. both sides right Okay, okay. Yeah. So then anyway, the sister, she goes in and she just lays it out and is basically, she's like, okay, so did this this attack occur? And she's like, yeah. And they're like, wow, there's no evidence of that. And she's like, okay, yeah, wheel in that DVD player. And then they play it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, basically, and then everyone's like, what the shit? <laughs> right? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, okay, well, what about like all this stuff occur, you know, occurring? And they're like, oh, yeah, okay. So here's all the documents proving that. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, nice. Yeah, so basically... Uh, yeah, she gets found innocent as well as she gets her um, citizenship, like, restored. She's not going to go to jail. And you're like, yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah. And then they also, like, they get, uh, yeah, like, they prove, obviously, that Bruman was a piece of crap. The Telebjorn guy turns out he's uh, has child abuse images, so they get him arrested. Good. They get... Yeah, they get all the people arrested that were involved in the cover-up and, you know, covering up all the crimes. It's pretty satisfying. Everybody just gets owned, essentially. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it just kind of ends on sort of, you know, Lisbeth travels away. And then, oh, I guess, no, I guess this is kind of interesting at the end. So Lisbeth leaves and then she comes back because uh, uh, Mikhail's sister is like, hey, I'll still be, I'll be your lawyer. But the only condition is, is you have to tell me the truth and you also have to be you know, if I contact you, you got to at least answer. <laughs> Elizabeth's okay. And so she, the sister, gives Elizabeth her father's assets. She's like, these are yours. You know, you're his daughter. And she's like, I don't want any of it. She's like, just sell it all away and give the money to charity. And she's like, that's fine, but you still got to sign the papers to say you got them or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So she signs the papers and then she was you know, at her house going through the assets and he owns like this old brickworks in the middle of nowhere. And she's like, that doesn't even make any sense. What the heck's going on? So she goes to investigate the brickworks. Turns out the Niedermeyer guy is there. Oh. So they have a confrontation. It's intense. And Elizabeth manages to use like a nail gun to like nail him to the floor. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like th through his like shoes and feet. Right. Yeah, okay. and so, and then she leaves, and I didn't mention this, but basically there was a biker gang involved, and they're looking for the Niedermeyer guy, so she calls the biker gang, like, at HQ, and was like, hey, that Niedermeyer guy's at these brickworks. And then she waits, and after they drive to go to the brickworks, she calls the cops and is like, hey, I think I saw that Niedermeyer guy there, and there's a bunch of bikers, and so they go, and then there's a big confrontation. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's pretty good. That's awesome. And then, yeah, at the end of the book, she's in her, her apartment that, uh, like I said, on a few people, not many people know where she lives. And Mikhail shows up with like some food similar. It mirrors the, uh, when he first met her in the first book with just some food and some uh, some coffee. And he's like, hey, do, do you want a friend kind of thing? <laughs> Aw. 
<laughs> yeah. And uh, she, you know, she's like, yeah, sure. They come on in kind of thing. Because, yeah, in that one year gap, there was like he she kind of cut him off because she's like uh, she kind of got jealous of him and Berger. And then so she was like, OK, I'm done with him kind of thing. But anyway, so, yeah, they're like they're friends. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any questions about the entire big weird conspiracy? <laughs> no, I think you explained it pretty good. Like I said, uh, pretty pretty broad. Try not to go into too many specifics because otherwise we'd be here all night. But they were good. Like I was surprised how much I enjoyed them, considering I usually don't enjoy this genre of writing. Like mystery. Yeah, some mysteries. Uh, yes, and but it's just like yeah, it's more like a crime ish oh, yeah. type book, right? And yeah, they were they really got me good. I enjoyed them. <laughs> so you also watched the movies, correct? So, yes. So I, I watch the normally like I, I have always advocated, like it's cool to do it backwards, like you watch the movie, then read the book. But then yeah. in this case, just because they were more of a whodunit mystery style, I was like, OK, you know what? I'll read the books first and yeah. then read and then watch the movies. So I watched, yeah, the 2011 uh, Fincher version with uh, Daniel Craig and Rooney Mara. And then I also watched the I think they came out in 2008 or nine, I think I want to say. Uh, Rooney Mara, not Rooney Mara, <laughs> Numi Repace version with uh, Michael ne- Michael Nyquist, or maybe it's Nyquist. I'm not I'm not 100 on his name, unfortunately. Uh, mm-hmm. Their version, which was made for Swedish television. Okay, cool. Yeah, and which it's just one was better. Well, it's comical because, of course, the David Fincher version they spent more money on that one single movie than the entire budget for the Swedish version. <laughs> <laughs> And the Swedish version did all three books, and they were three hours a piece. Wow! Uh, for each book, yes. But what's kind of interesting is thinking about it, comparing like book one or yeah, book one, movie one from both versions, is that because the the Fincher movie is like two something in length, so it's almost the same amount as the Swedish version and covers almost the same thing. Like I said, there's a couple scenes here or there with like you know, the daughter character or something, you know, maybe a little bit here and there thrown in, but both versions are essentially the same. <laughs> okay. And they, um, uh, does it, is one truer to the book than the other? I think the, I think if you want to just, yeah, compare it just straight on that, the Swedish one is a little truer just because there's a little more time to introduce some stuff. Yeah, But they sense. both fall under the same pit trap. Like I jokingly texted you about that. It's like, it's a mystery there's four characters in the movie. I wonder who the bad guy is. <laughs> Cause it's like, you know, in many stories of the bad guy is somebody you've never seen, you'd be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> the feature yeah. version is, is really good. I, I actually really liked I liked Daniel Craig. I liked Marini Mara. I think she was nominated or won an Oscar for this performance. Right. I think she did too. Yeah, I don't know I, if she won, but I think she was nominated. I know she was definitely nominated. I don't know if she won, but yeah, Christopher Plummer's in there. He was really good, and uh, Skarsgård is in there. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, so like I said, it it's good. It's really well made. Of course, David Fincher, you would not not a surprise there. Um, Did um, Nine Inch Nails do the soundtrack? <laughs> I actually, uh, I was Trent Reznor and somebody else. I think you did that. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but the crazy thing, I think I texted you, and I don't know if you still did. Have you managed to watch the credit sequence for this movie? No, not yet. I should do that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. The, the opening credit sequence does not match the movie. Like, the opening credit sequence is incredible. If it was like, this is a short animated credit sequence of some kind, like, not connected to the movie. <laughs> Because it like has an inappropriate song, at least I don't think the song matches. And then like all it's like Bond, James Bond imagery basically going on with like oil and hacker stuff and everything. And I was like, this is insane. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wait, yeah. should I should we pause while I go watch it? No, no, it's fine. It's not okay. a deal. Uh the funniest thing though I think about this version is that Daniel Craig filmed it in between James Bond movies. So he's even though he gained weight for the movie, he's still pretty buff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like there's scenes where he's got his like arms crossed and he's just you're just like, dude, your arms are giant still. <laughs> but does he speak in his Knives Out accent? No, unfortunately, he doesn't. <laughs> oh, I was hoping that was his Swedish accent. <laughs> no, he just speaks in his normal British accent. 
Oh, bummer. But the movie, to its credit, does take place in Sweden. They didn't change the location because the story is really rooted in that, in like the cold and the, you know, the winters up there and stuff like that. So to its, and that's what was insane about it as well, is that there was like these elaborate flashback sequences and stuff like that, that were like, you just know, like the way Hollywood, were, like that's like a movie practically that they filmed on top of their movie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But yeah, actually I enjoyed it. It was really well made, but what was also comical is that it was released at Christmas, which that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, it's a Christmas movie, just like um, Eyes Wide Shut. Well, and that's what was funny is that the the trailer, I watched the trailer, and it was like the feel-bad movie of Christmas. And I was like, that was your marketing? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, want to feel like shit? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, it's rated R because of the assaults and the murder and everything, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's like, so it was aimed at adults, and it's like, yeah, but Christmas is, you know, usually you have your family and you're not like, let's go watch this hardcore R-rated movie with my family, right? Like, <laughs> so it unfortunately didn't perform as well as they thought because they they had the, like, the actors were signed on to continue as the characters. And Fincher was never really, like, fully attached to the project, but the screenwriter still was. It just never happened. It, uh you know, even a couple of years later, there was interviews with Rooney Mara and she's like, yeah, I'm still in if this is going down. But it never did until they recently remade. Well, they made that uh, 2018 Girl in the Spider's Web, which was book four. So they skipped book two and three. Oh, weird. I I don't know why I thought they had made all three. Well, maybe because the Swedish version, they did make all three. That might be it. Yeah. And this was really what put uh, Numi Repace on the map. I think she did a great job. It's just a different kind of performance than Rooney Mara's performance. Um, you know, and they're, they are different women, of course. And the Swedish version, yeah, I, I really liked the, the two and three. It was just cool to see it on screen. I think they did a pretty good job. Like, like in anything, they had to cut out a lot of, like, you know, text-based research or this or that kind of thing. To Even the, the, the Fincher version, the same thing, because it's like, this just doesn't work visually, right? <laughs> so yeah, people totally. just like tapping on a screen and reading pages upon pages of stuff it's like that's in a montage and it's two minutes long and it's over right no it should be like a 10 minute montage with <laughs> yeah, intense exactly. music but it's just somebody being like type 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 yeah <laughs> type 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 <laughs> so yeah they were pretty i think they were pretty good and they they were focused on the books what was weird was is in the third movie in the third book there's a there's a big subplot with burger and her leaving the magazine which i didn't really mention but mm -hmm. like she starts to receive threats and stuff like that. And the Swedish movie starts to implement the the threats part of that, but not her leaving the magazine, which was like the cause of the threats and stuff. So it was weird and it was unresolved as well in the in the movie. I was like, you could have just not put that in, right? Yeah, weird choice. It was a weird choice because it was like it just didn't make sense. It was just kind of it seemed like that it was just like almost too too random. And yeah. same thing, I didn't like in, so this is what I was saying, is in the Swedish movie in the, of the third book, is the characters don't have all of the same evidence and, like, information until, like, the trial is already kind of ongoing, and then they get the evidence, and they're like, oh, yeah, we can use this, like, in the trial. So it's like, I get sort of that can that can kind of build tension because you're like what are they going to do how are they going to get out of it but it's also satisfying in the book to be like you know that they have all the aces and you're like they are going to screw them good <laughs> right <laughs> so i'm curious to see if if the hollywood versions if they would have either if which direction they would have gone if they continued on making them do you think they'll make them two or three eventually or i don't think so uh, maybe maybe like you know in a reboot situation, they might do them all again, but maybe not because I guess it's untested or it was unproven that people would watch them. Yeah. I could see maybe like an Amazon or like a Netflix kind of thing could happen. That could, that could, and they could do like a similar thing where they do uh, like a limited series kind of yeah, deal. Yeah. Do like six episodes like the Swedish one did and be like, it's going to be six hours and here's all three books. That would be cool. Yeah, I think that could be really cool. I was mildly interested in watching the girl with the spider web hat or whatever it's called. Yeah, What's the girl in the spider web. Uh, yeah, because Claire Foy is in it and she played the queen in The Crown in right. the first two seasons. 
And she looks unrecognizable in this movie. And I'm like, I am curious to see what she does with this role because she's very good at being the queen. Yeah, and it was so weird because, like, that movie just, like, kind of came and went. Like, Yeah, I don't think anybody saw it. Yeah, well, and I, I kind of wanted to talk briefly a bit about the author as well as some of the things and some of his ideas for the story because, uh, unfortunately, he died in 2004. Oh. Yeah, and so he died in 2004 at the age of 50 uh, from a heart attack. And oh, geez, he was super young. Yeah, so, yeah, this is some interesting stuff I found. So he was a journalist and a writer. And Uh in his early years, he mostly wrote wrote sci-fi. He ran, like, his own little sci-fi fanzine and stuff like that. And uh, then eventually transitioned into journalism. And he focused on socialist politics and was a researcher of right-wing extremism. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so in in 91, he published a book called, uh, again, I'll probably butcher this, but it's called, like, Extreme Hogren, which means the extreme right. And it was about... Uh, right-wing nationalism stuff in Sweden. (laughs) Well, that would be super interesting to read. Yeah, and so he became kind of like an influential debater and like a lecturer on the subject. Like he knew his stuff and um, apparently lived under death threats for years because of his research and his books. Oh, geez. And so this is where it kind of got interesting for me when I was reading this is because, of course, he died in 2004. In 2008... (gasps) Do you think uh, he was murdered? No, he, he died of a heart attack. Apparently his diet was like coffee and cigarettes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Apparently Murdered. he did not leave, <laughs> Yeah, he did not leave, lead a healthy lifestyle according to what I was reading. His partner, his longtime partner, Eva uh Gabrielson, mm-hmm. uh claimed to have found a will from 1990, 1977 that was gonna leave all of his assets to the Socialist Party of Sweden. Oh. But the will was unwitnessed and so under Swedish law was invalid okay and normally because like I said that she was he was she was his longtime partner and the reason reportedly that they didn't get married okay okay I was gonna ask do you mean like love partner or like work partner (laughs) well I assume they were in a relationship because but they because they never got married because under Swedish law when you get married you have to register your address with the government (laughs) <laughs> oh my god could you imagine being his like his girlfriend and being like no babe we can't get married i don't want the government to know where i live well it, it, it becomes not just not the government sorry but it becomes like public record oh okay okay yeah. that makes more sense <laughs> sorry yes i was miswording that uh it becomes public record and because he was receiving death threats from extremist groups he was like i don't want to you know People don't know my address. <laughs> that is absolutely fair. The other one, I would have been like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what <did you> say, <laughs> buddy? <laughs> yeah. No, sorry. I was clearly mis- mis- saying the wrong thing. Uh, so, unfortunately, she has no right to any of the inheritance and the rights and everything that is connected with this book series and any of his works. They don't have common law? I don't know. I, I guess, uh, again, I, I don't know Swedish law and maybe they have to register things. Oh, yeah. Um, so all of the rights and everything apparently went to his brother and his father, uh, Stig Larsson's brother and father, but apparently they were, like, estranged. He, like, never talked with them at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? shit. Yeah, so it's an odd situation because um, Gabrielson basically claims that he... So initially he planned for 10 books of a series... He had written three quarters of the fourth book and had like, you know, outlines for uh, like the next two at the Mm -hmm. time of his death. No one else has access to it except for her. And she's like, I she she actually offered to write it and finish it. But people were like, she again wouldn't be able to get money out of it or, you know, again, there was real weird right stuff. So the girl in the spider web, like we talked a bit about, it's written by someone else entirely just based off those three books. Like it wasn't part of his plan, essentially. Oh, weird. Yeah, it's really weird. That, oh, that's weird, strange legal stuff, hey? Yeah, it, and, and like I said, that's why I thought it was kind of interesting, and I kind of want to bring that up, because, yeah, they were written. So the series continued on with a new writer. Um, let's see, his name is David Legerkrantz, and he's also a Swedish, uh, Swedish author and journalist. 
Mm-hmm. And but he didn't have access to, like I said, the, to that to that book and to that materials and the outline. So he just kind of wrote him on his own. The, there was a release in 2015, which was uh, again so a Swedish title, "That Which Doesn't Kill Us," which was "Girl in the Spider's Web." Mm-hmm. And then in 2017, there was "The Man Who Hunted His Shadow," which was published under English for "The Girl Who Takes an Eye for an Eye." And the sixth book was in 2019 and had the title "She Who Must Die." which was called The Girl Who Lived Twice, which very James Bond. <laughs> yeah, very James Bond. So he wrote these three, uh, Lager Krantz did, and then he said after he wrote the third one that, that he was not going to write anymore for the series. So I don't know if the series is done. I don't know what the plan was. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting that it continued on with an entire different author with these characters. So are those books under the new author's name or are they under the old author's name? Like, was he no, hired they're definitely as... under the new author. Oh, okay. I was going to say, was he hired as, like, a ghostwriter or something, but... It's probably, it probably uh, you know, it says, like, Daniel... Or, no, sorry, uh, David Lager Krantz, and it'll probably say, like, based off the characters created by Stig Larsson or whatever, right? Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. I wonder and... I wonder how Stig Larsson's uh, partner feels about that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, like I said, she doesn't have any technical rights to it and everything, so she... I think I was reading a little bit that she, again, she offered to write, to continue the story using his outlines, Stig Larson's mm-hmm. outlines, but I guess I couldn't find any evidence that that, like, that that was happening or she was given the go-ahead or what kind of a thing. Yeah. And I think, I, I think if she, from her standpoint, that, yeah, if she's not getting, if she's not going to get any, receive anything because she didn't create these characters, then maybe she would just get like a, a commission, be like, you know, a flat payment to be like, finish the book, cool, but you're not going to get royalties because you don't technically own the characters or whatever, right? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, it's kind of a, just an odd situation. That kind of happened, well, no, similar, but not the same. But the the lady who wrote The Vampire Diaries? Right. Do you know about this? I don't, but I know those series of books, yeah. Okay, so basically, um, sometimes books, or sorry, sometimes publishing companies will hire authors if there's like a trend going on and right, they'll be like, like a writer for hire. What's that? Like a writer for hire. Just be like, come yeah. And they'll be it. like, listen, we'll pay you this much money and we need you to write um, a teen romance about vampires mm-hmm. because it's hot right now. So she got hired to do that, but she just got like a really measly flat fee. Right. And they became like huge. And then, yeah, it became huge. She gets no royalties from the TV show. There's no involvement in that. Um, they fired her after, like, five books or something like that and hired a different author to, like, finish them. Oh, weird. Yeah, and then because of weird, like, <laughs> weird, like, fan fiction-y laws, she w- she completed her series over fan fiction, but, like, she doesn't <laughs> make money from that, right? <laughs> nice. That's awesome, though. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, isn't that crazy? Like, she didn't get any money from the show. She didn't get any, doesn't get any royalties. She just got paid, like, a flat fee. And um, and then they, like, tossed her out. And she, um, she's published some other stuff, but it hasn't done as well as Vampire Diaries. Yeah, and I could see if, like you said, she was fired after the fifth book, that she was probably trying to renegotiate, like, a new contract, right? And they were like, yeah, like, eh, we'll just fire and- you. Yeah, you would want to renegotiate a new contract at that point. If you yeah, like. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so she finished her story through fan fiction. Huh. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's really weird. I watched like a two and a half hour YouTube video about it because that's what I do with my life. Wee! Wow. Like you said, I mean, that's the kind of thing we kind of talk about here and there. So that is kind of odd. And I yeah. could definitely see that. I could definitely see something like that happening, but it's also like how unfortunate that it's like, yeah, if the, I guess I don't know what the, that timeline of that series is like, she wrote the first one and it wasn't as popular until like book two or three that it's like, you know, after it started kind of taking off, you'd be like, okay, look guys, we need to renegotiate this thing. I'm writing this like, come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think it had, I, I could be making this up. So don't, you know, use me as a source when you're writing your thesis about vampire diaries yeah yeah uh but i'm pretty sure it's somehow tied to scholastic book fairs right somehow i don't know 
But yeah, wouldn't that suck if you wrote a bunch of books and they're like, you get nothing. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, and I'm sure there's got to be stories in it. Like, like the way Hollywood accounting, like you always hear all these stories about movies and stuff like that, where people basically get paid zero or very little because, you know, it's based off of the gross and not the net. And they're like, oh, the movie lost money because we are ourselves our distributor, right? Like it happens all the time. And it's just like, ugh, such a way, way to go. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. But the, I was just say a couple more things that I thought were kind of interesting. Stig Larson, he was saying that it, like he was influenced a lot by American and British crime detective authors, and his heroine is very similar to a character named Carol, or sorry, named Mallory from a book by Karen O'Connell, who appeared in 1994, uh, called Mallory's Oracle. And I briefly looked it up, and she's similar-ish, you know, small woman uh, works, but she's a like she's a cop, and you know she has good computer skills. But uh, I think that's where the similarities kind of end. But uh, oh, yeah. same same kind of thing. But it was kind of interesting that he admits that he was influenced by Pippi Longstocking. Oh, weird. Who was, yeah, it was written by a children's author from Sweden, uh, Astrid Lindgren is her name. And he just kind of envisioned her as like a grown up Pippi Longstocking, which he kind of created. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. And that the other character, M Michael or Mikhail Blomkist, uh, also has a nickname called Calais Blomkist, which is like, I think means like Kid Blomkist. And uh, that's also from a teenage detective that Lindgren wrote. And the name Salander is also inspired from that series. Uh, because Callie's girlfriend's name is uh, Eva L Lizander, which I guess was a small was a series of detective teenage detective novels. <laughs> uh, cool. <laughs> so yeah, like uh, yeah, he he admitted that, that he's just like yeah, this is what I was kind of inspired by this. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, but yeah, that's all really kind of I wanted to, that I got to say really. I mean, I just like I said, I found an, uh, the. The part about the the rights and the continuation of the series without him or his notes was kind of interesting because, uh, like I've mentioned many times, I have read The Wheel of Time. And, of course, Robert Jordan died before finishing it. And then they hired Brandon Sanderson to finish it. But he did have, you know, outlined and notes and et cetera to work with and like kind of the blessing of the family and et cetera. It wasn't just like it wasn't like a rogue job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a rogue job <laughs> or like you said he just didn't write it on fanfiction.com and put it out there <laughs> <laughs> but yeah any other questions it sort no, of makes I sense no I don't think so it sounds cool do you recommend it to people yeah I think in this case like I said i not usually partial to this kind of media but I very much enjoyed uh, the, the books and the movies I mean the books were better but that's kind of the reality, usually. <laughs> yeah, generally, the books are better. <laughs> yeah. I think especially for the first one, just for because the because the, the, the story's sort of smaller in the second one because they're a little more focused, whereas the first one, because they're investigating this big thing, and in the book, of course, there are more characters. He interviews more people, and he, he, there's more involvement, whereas in the movies, like I said, there's like four characters, and you're like, okay, one's a bad guy, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Devin? Would you think of visiting some of this or still think it's, it's not, I think not it, your cup of tea? I would read a censored version or watch okay. a censored version because it yeah. does sound interesting. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that I was very shocked by the, the Fincher version was uh, the, like I said, yeah, when he assaults her that he like, yeah, he grabs her, he handcuffs her and blah, blah, blah. And then I think he, you know, he, he hits her and then she's on the ground and then it kind of like, cuts and then or not cuts but yeah like shows a door close and there's some yelling and i was like okay it's tasteful we get it it's horrible but then it yeah. just kept going and i was like holy whoa i was not ready for that <laughs> yeah i think i'd watch like the tv version of it where they cut out that scene <laughs> sure that's fair yeah yeah but were you really shocked he did do seven <laughs> sure but seven you don't really see anything happen in seven it's always after the fact right it's still pretty gruesome yeah, but, but I'm just, you know, it's like, what's in the box is a prop head, right? <laughs> it's not. No, it's actually Gwyneth Paltrow's head. <laughs> She's that method, yeah. <laughs> She's that method, and then she used goop to put it back on her body. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It was good. I do recommend it, and I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Should I wrap up? 
Sure. I, I think, like I said, I've, I've talked for like an hour about it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you liked this episode, please share it with your friends and rate and review us on whatever. And also follow us on Instagram, Tome of Uselessness. You can check out the website, tomeoflesslessness.com, and you can send us an email if you have a suggestion, tomeoflesslessness at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. And thank you for listening, and have a wonderful the rest of your life. Yeah, stay safe, and thanks for listening. Bye! Bye!